This episode of the podcast is brought to you by our friends at Regrow, the premier cloud-based cannabis supply chain management system. Compared to other software systems in the cannabis market, when you choose Regrow as a strategic business partner, you'll get all aspects of regulatory compliance built in with the added value of workforce management, inventory, SOP management, and reporting and metrics that allow for companies to scale successfully. Regrow is the first of its kind software that leverages components of leading ERP and supply chain management systems with the necessary compliance of the cannabis industry. Regrow is the single pane of glass view into your entire supply chain that is built to automate manual tasks, reduce costs, and avoid shortages by creating dynamic workflows that maximize yields and increase profitability for your business. So it's time to ditch the whiteboards and spreadsheets and talk to the team at Regrow. Visit their website at regrow.io. That's regrow.io. Regrow, the premier cloud-based cannabis supply chain management system. Hello, my fellow people of the plant. Thanks for tuning in to another episode of the Cannabinoid Connect podcast, your favorite podcast that includes industry-facing conversations with the industry's leading experts that aim to educate and inform the public regarding the plant's endless benefits. My guest today is Jason Wilde. He's the president at JW Asset Management. Ladies and gentlemen, we have a very special guest today, the founder and chief investment officer at JW Asset Management and living legend, Jason Wild. How are you, sir? I'm good. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. Thank you so much for, for making time for me and my audience today. Oh, my pleasure. My pleasure. Yeah, we're going to have a lot of great, interesting things to talk about. Obviously, there's a lot going on in the uh, cannabis industry right now. Um, but before we dive into all that, Jason, let's set the kind of the foundation or the theme for this episode. Um, we hear a lot about cannabis and the many opportunities and benefits that it presents, both from a medicinal, economic, environmental standpoint, right? And, and as we near toward uh, the end of prohibition, there's a lot of talk, especially within the MSO gang, about cannabis being the next great American growth story. Right. So that's really the theme in which I want to kind of base this conversation on today. So let's kick it off. And why don't you tell us, Jason, what that means to you and why you you believe in that? Uh, in terms of it being the next great American growth story? Correct. Yes. Sure. Absolutely. Well, it's, you know, we sort of had, uh, you know, um, the first round of uh, cannabis in terms of these public names was uh, the Canadian uh, Opportunities. Uh, which, you know, most of those peaked somewhere, uh, you know, towards uh, the third or fourth quarter of 2018. Uh, and the problem with that story, and, and we were big investors in the Canadian space before we invested in the U.S., uh, you know, from 14 to 18, we did nothing in the U.S. because I was, you know, actually worried about getting arrested, uh, <laughs> which, you know, usually gets a little bit of a chuckle uh, now, but just a couple, a few years ago, it was not, uh, it, it wasn't as, you know, as funny of a, uh, of, of a thought. Sure. But, um, but the difference is Canada back then was um, it was all the dream. There were no companies that were necessarily that were really putting up big numbers. You know, October of 18 was when rec or adult use picked up, uh, you know, uh, started in uh, in Canada and all the stocks peaked right around that right around that time. And it wasn't, uh, you know, uh, there weren't any companies that had, you know, any profits or even pre-tax profits. It was just you know, people uh, finding a way to play, you know, what they thought was going to be a trend, which was, you know, cannabis use in increasing and being legal in more places in, in the future. So the newer, you know, sort of the 2.0 version of that has been the U.S. operators. They all started going public, you know, say, you know, some sort of towards the end of, uh, uh, towards the end of 18. Uh, and they have built, by and large, there's a lot of uh, substantial companies, substantial, credible companies that are uh, that are you know profitable at least from a uh, an EBITDA per perspective. So I think it's very different than the than sort of the first round, which was the Canadian names. Uh, I think that uh, when we talk a lot about it, sort of uh, the U.S. and the, the MSO gang and all that, it's because uh, the craziness is you turn on CNBC and they talk about you know uh, some legalization effort or something happening in Virginia about a. Uh, legalization and they and they put up you know uh, uh aurora and apria and you know uh, tilray Til yeah Ray, which is right. like you know which is which is uh, uh frustrating to a lot of investors we know that the reason is because they can list on the ux us exchanges um 
I think that we are going to be able to see listings uh, by the U.S. operators on the U.S. exchanges, hopefully uh, within, uh, you know, this calendar year. Uh, and I think that, uh, you know, and we've got these great vibrant businesses with legalization and growth happening in more and more states, you know, every, every right. Month. Right. Well, I'm so glad that you brought up the Canadian LPs versus the U.S. MSOs, right? Because from my perspective, I mean, I just got in at the wrong time, 2018. And I don't think it was a matter of choosing sides at the time, right? It was just like Canada was fully blown legal. Um, you had some states in the U.S. that were operating doing it. But a lot of the attention was on the Canadian exchanges just because those companies were prominent. They were listed. There was, there was, like you said, mainstream media exposure. So in my eyes, it was more of like a learning experience and, and really just kind of understanding the value that these American multi-state operators bring to this table, right? Um, and so for me, and I think for a lot of others, I, I don't think it was a matter of choosing sides. It's just like, you know, we're just learning more and more. And the, the U.S. market is just becoming more mature every day. I mean, we have, what, five more states that are that are about to vote on uh, adult use. <clears throat> yeah, I, I, I totally agree with that. And it, it's just um, and, and, you know, and the U.S. is set up, at least right now, stru structurally in a better place. You know, it's crazy to say that the U.S. is set up structurally better because we have conflict between state and federal law and all of that. <laughs> But therein lies the opportunity. It makes every market more of a local market or every state is, is its own country to a certain extent. And that's really part of the problem in Canada was, you know, uh, if you're trying to uh, sell your flour, if you're an operator in, in Toronto and you're trying to sell your flour into the Ontario uh, distribution, uh, you know, you're competing with product that's, that's been flown in from BC or from wherever else in the country. Right. Another, another uh, disadvantage of the Canadian setup is that the government in most states, the uh, most uh, most provinces, the uh, government controls the uh, distribution of it. Even if they don't own the stores, they are the wholesaler. So it's a lot harder to do well when you have one central wholesaler in every in every province. And also on top of that, the government was uh, very uh, sort of uh, strict in terms of what the packaging should look like. So in a space where even in the U.S. it's hard to create. Uh, brands that transcend the uh, state lines. It's even harder on Canada because you can only have like three colors on the packaging and no uh, logos bigger than a different size and all of that. So those are the reasons that, you know, that Canada ended up being a disappointment. And I was, you know, talking about learning and going through a learning experience. Like, you know, I've been the same way. Uh, you know, we invested from 14 to 18 in Canada. Uh, fortunately, we were earlier, so we still did well, but we didn't, you know, we didn't sell all these things uh, near their 52 week highs for sure. Um, but you need to uh, you need to always sort of be reevaluating what you're what you're invested in and be open to the fact that, uh, you know, you may be wrong. And in Canada, right. you know, the market didn't develop to the extent that I thought that it was going to. And at the same time, you know, we had this uh, the, we, now, we now have this had this alternative where there were these great businesses we were coming across in the U.S. and they were trading at like a, a fraction of the valuations that the Canadian ones were, were trading at. Um, so that's why we uh, pivoted. But, um, you know, as somebody, you know, you were involved in the sector for a while, the U.S. names didn't really separate themselves from the Canadian names until more like the summer or the spring of last year. Right. You no, know, it's been a little bit of a long haul. It took longer for them to uh, separate. I felt like as long as I was out of the Canadian ones and I was in the U.S., then I was fine. But the Canadian ones still took the U.S. ones down for another year and year and change. At this point, uh, you know, they finally really, I believe, uh, uh, separated to a large extent. Uh, although the Canadian ones still trade at you know higher value weight, higher multiples than than the U.S., so I still think we have some room to go. Sure. And again, like it's just you've got so many businesses that you can point to in the U.S. that are doing well, even more so than back in '18 when I pivoted into the U.S. There were barely any uh, there, you know any operators that were that were really doing really well. Um, and that was why we first for Terrasen we first came in in California because that was one of the biggest markets, and we found you know, the apothecarium asset that we thought was this great asset and we could roll it out in other places in the country. But, you know, over the following six months or so, we saw all these, they're all, we were coming across all these operators on the East Coast in these limited license states that were just, you know, crushing it. Right. From, uh, you know, just because there was so much less competition. Uh, and that's why we continued to evolve for Terrace End in terms of what we were looking at. And we found the Ilera deal in Pennsylvania, which has, you know, was, was definitely, uh, you know, a, yeah. A, a great deal for us and it's been a big driver of our of our numbers we had already applied in jersey and won 
Um, but, you know, now who would have known that Jersey was going to be, uh, you know, uh, uh, one of the first states on the East Coast to legalize right. rec. And, uh, you know, we're super excited about that. Um, I guess my point is, yes, the New York, uh, New York, uh, the U.S. is the, uh, the best opportunities are in the U.S., that's that's true in practically every industry. It's not just cannabis, <laughs> right? I mean, there's just you know, there's just so much more, uh, so much larger of an economy uh, uh, in the U.S. So definitely, uh, the U- U.S. is definitely uh, to me the growth story in a place where all the I don't want to say low hanging fruit because it's difficult, but uh, there's more, uh, there's so much more opportunity in the U.S. than anywhere else uh, in the, uh, in, in the country. Right. But even amongst, even among that, uh, the, in terms of, uh, the U S states, we are, uh, uh, for our terror center for, and for my fund, we want to be in limited license states in the U S not unlimited license states in the U S which is going to really keep you mostly like East of the Mississippi. Right. Yeah, no. And I, I definitely want to get into Terrasen strategy. I know that y'all have a, a, a really big market sharing Pennsylvania, as you mentioned, California, um, and now New Jersey, and then of course Gage, which I know is be, is going to be going public uh, here really soon. Um, so before we jump into that, Jason, I want to I want to unpack some of the points you made earlier and that analogy of like you know the U.S. is is in that unique position where you've got the states that are operating the own way, you know the way they want, and then you've got the federal regulation, and these states are basically operating as their their own countries, right? Yeah. And and you touched on the point earlier, and we've seen it. We've 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 tweeted it. We've talked about how the these mainstream media outlets, CNBC, Bloomberg News, they're not talking about the MSOs, and they're talking about these Canadian LPs, right? And and is it because of that federal regulation, right? I, I don't. I, I can't imagine that Jim Cramer and these analysts are that blind as to see the balance sheets, the cash on hand from these companies that are operating in the U.S. compared to the Canadian companies. Is it that they cannot, you know, talk about these companies and and kind of um, boost them in a way because they're not listed on the American exchanges and they're still federally legal in this country? I think I don't I don't think that it's a policy that CNBC is telling them you can't talk about them because they're federally illegal businesses. I think it's just a uh, you know a matter of protecting yourselves. Like you go out and you start talking about pink sheet listed stocks. And if it doesn't work out, you know, people are going to say, you know, CNBC, what did you, what did you right. do to us? Right. Versus, like, but to me, you know, um, it's the, you know, you know, the Warren Buffett quote, uh, short term, the market is a voting machine and long term, it's a weighing machine. Like, <laughs> I would feel safer if I was Jim Cramer or any of the other folks on CNBC, I would feel safer. Um, we know the structural reason of why the U.S. companies can't list on the U.S. exchanges right now. It's not because they're lower quality companies, because in my view, and in most people's views, they're better quality companies than the ones that can list right now in terms of, you know, the Canadian LPs. So if we do the whole, uh, you know, short term, the market is a voting machine, and long term, it's a weighing machine, I would feel safer recommending companies that qualified under the weighing machine, meaning they're real businesses that are going to be sustainable and right. make money over the long term versus the voting machine ones, which are which are the Canadian ones, uh, but but maybe some people feel safer uh, talking about a, an exchange listed company. But you know, I don't look at it that way. That's why you know, like Terrasen moved into the U.S. We were we're the only Canadian LP that pivoted into the U.S. and uh, you know and gave up our uh, ability to be able to go to the TSX uh, or the or the U.S. exchanges because we were operating in the U.S. It was much more important to me to build a real business, and I think it should be more important to whoever is talking about it on TV to recommend or to talk about the real businesses, not the, not the ones that are a little, that are going to be more challenged. Yeah. It seems like that that's their job, right? I mean, <laughs> to yeah. inform the public with, uh, with the, the right information, but I mean, I think yeah. I've heard your famous quote is they can pay us now or they can pay us more later. So, so that's the, you know, <laughs> the kind of makes sense. Right. And so Jason, let me ask you this one more policy and regulation question, then yeah. we'll jump into Terrasen. And yeah. that is, um, you know, obviously there's momentum happening in the Senate, uh, Senate majority leader, Chuck Schumer, Booker, they're, you know, they're, they're wrangling up this policy. So are we going to see safe banking first? Are we going to see removal of 280E? I mean, and when do the institutional investors come in? Yeah, they're coming in already. I mean, they, they started coming in really uh, uh, to a large extent uh, a- after the uh, uh, Georgia um, you know, uh, election in, uh, in January, where the, where the Democrats, uh, you know, uh, picked up those two seats. Uh, that was when I saw a real change. I mean, you know, um, uh, 
uh, you saw it. I, I think it was like over a billion and a half has been raised just since then in the last couple of months. And a lot of it was raised very quickly, you know, in those first few weeks of uh, few weeks of January. So I can tell you in terms of the financing that TerraSend did, it was all, you know, we raised, we went out to raise 50 million, you know, in the past when we've gone, gone out to raise uh, amounts like that, it was lots of ones and twos and family offices and smaller funds, hedge funds and things like that. And this one was, uh, was essentially, you know, uh, four accounts did over 80% of it. And, and it was, uh, we had 200 million in demand on, on a $50 million that we wanted to raise. So that was completely different than what we had seen just, you know, uh, eight months, uh, eight months earlier. So the U.S. investors, I think, are there in terms of progress and timing and term, what, what's going to happen. I've been so wrong, you know, for when I start, first started investing in, in Canada back in 14 or 15, I was sure the U.S. would be legal within about five years. And, you know, it has it obviously hasn't happened there. Um, I think that we're hopefully we're going to see safe banking. But to me, the most important aspects of safe or whether it's done within safe or done within, you know, some other framework is you know, getting rid of 280E, obviously that's a huge uh, burden on the system and, and uh, uh, that money could be spent so much better, you know, hiring more people, but, you know, about putting money into the facilities, all that stuff. Right. And I think that that's really when you're really going to start to see the MSO shine, right? Because there's no other industry where there's that such heavy burden and constraint when it comes to cash flow, right? And and what you're doing. And and so once that's removed, I mean, these these companies are already doing well. So I just can't imagine at that point what happens, you know? Yes, I agree. But but that is also going to open the market to, uh, you know, more competition. If we get if we get safe, you know, the other thing, the two things I think we need are 280E, uh, whether it's within safe or somewhere else, 280E, and uh, we need safe harbor for the exchanges to list uh, U.S. companies, you know, to be able to list on the NASDAQ or the New York Stock Exchange. Uh, if we get that, that will be uh, huge for the industry, but it also, you know, it opens up it opens it up for other companies that are listed on the New York Stock Exchange or the Nasdaq right now right. to come in and uh, to come in and compete. I think right. I, I think it's good. I mean, that's the whole pay me now or pay me more later because <laughs> if it happens soon, then we're gonna be we're gonna see a big jump in valuations for for all these names or a further jump uh, because they can be on the exchanges and because they can be bought by companies on those exchanges. But um, I think we actually make more money. Uh, if it, if it takes a little while, because these businesses could be built, you know, uh, further and then get a jump in valuation from, from that point. Um, that's, that's from an economic perspective. I think from a, uh, from a social justice perspective and the fact that so many people, uh, are getting uh, arrested every single day for doing similar things in states where it's illegal or, you know, uh, or states where they are legal, like New Jersey, right? I mean, 6,000 people were arrested after that bill passed. I mean, it's crazy that this stuff's still happening, you know? Right. So, so that's why we need, uh, that, that's why I, I, we need, you know, legalization uh, uh, as well. But there will be a, uh, the, the good thing overall is that even if, uh, you, you know, we get to the point where we have legalization or the, or the listing of the companies, that's going to bring in more, you know, sort of adults in the room. Like I like to think that Terrasen or my fund or some of the or some of the adults in the room. Um, but you know, once there's conglomerates that are, you know, multi billions dollar of dollars to be able to throw at this, it's not. You know, my my view is it's like not going to be as much fun anymore. Um, but but we're going to see. We should see a very large jump in valuations for all of these companies before you know, sort of before that. That has to happen in, before we get everybody, you know, jumping into the, uh, sure. you know, jumping into the pool. Yeah, no, there's going to be legs and room to grow for sure. And, and I, I think what you're saying, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but federal yeah. legalization, I mean, it's not going to happen overnight, right? Even if it passes the next two years or four years, there's going to be so much kind of just implementation of policy and regulation that's going to be in place to wrap their heads around this, that it's going to take some time. So in yeah. that, in that, you know, duration, that's where you're going to start to see these companies really start to get their valuations up and, and yeah. grow so that they can then be acquired by the major conglomerates, whether it be in the pharmaceutical industry, uh, you know, beverage space, uh, tobacco, whatever it is, right. Whatever it is. Exactly. And I, uh, and, and, and I think that if you're, you know, another approach in terms of, you know, us being focused on limited license states, not only that, we only want to be invested in operators that are, that are sort of the top three operators in any given market. 
because I think that you also, you need scale uh, in order to, when, if and when things get more competitive, there is going to be a, uh, there's going to be a point where a 200,000 square foot cultivator in, you know, on the East coast, even if, even if, if, and when pricing gets more compressed, they'll still be able to make money. Uh, but a 50,000 square foot grower will not be able to make money. Right. Um, so I think that if things get more competitive, especially if, uh, you know, uh, other companies can get into the space, you want to make sure that you have the best scaled operations in any, in any given state, you know, uh, because it'll make you compete. I, I don't do anything to try to, uh, I'm not a, uh, I'm a big believer in not investing in anything because I think they're going to be bought by somebody else because then you don't, you never build the business the right, right. way. Like in my view, you have to run a business like you're like you're going to be running it for the next 30 years. And then if somebody comes along and wants to buy you, they know that, uh, you know, uh, that you have other alternatives and you're built for the long term. So but I think that those scaled operations will be more attractive also for these conglomerates when when they come in. But the real reason to me is you can make uh, you can have, you'll have better margins now. You're protected. Your margins are going to be more protected in the future when prices get more competitive. And, you know, and the extra benefit is when, when uh, those big players come in, they're going to want to buy those, those uh, scaled assets. Right, right. No, that makes sense. And that's actually a really great, great segue. Because, I mean, when we talk, we look at JW Assets uh, portfolio of companies, right? You got Terrasen, Gage, Cannabis. And just like you mentioned, <clears throat> perfectly positioned, you know, in markets where uh, they have limited, you know, limited licenses, like you mentioned, and then they have the ability to scale and grow, right? So let's talk, talk about TerraSend and, uh, you know, kind of what the company is doing in terms of its growth strategy in California and um, its current operations and, and foothold, you know, within the states of, like I mentioned, Pennsylvania and newly uh, New Jersey, which went adult use. Sure. So, um, yeah, so California, well, just want to point out quickly, Michigan is sort of an anomaly. It's not really a limited license state. It's, it's, a, it's a hybrid because it's sort of limited by the localities about, you know, in terms of how many dispensaries they'll allow and things like that. But it's a little bit of, a, a, of an anomaly. But we can come back to Gage uh, afterwards. Uh, I just wanted to make sure I correct sure, you. Sure, sure. Uh, in terms of... Uh, uh, no, thank you. Middle yeah. Um, in terms of... Uh, in terms of TerraSend, um, I think your first part was California. California was our first acquisition. Uh, California is a more competitive state, like I mentioned. I mean, you know, it, it, as long as you qualify in California, you can get a license. I joke, it's like getting a driver's license, you know, um, but uh, without the eye test, I guess. But, <laughs> the, um, you know, California is more competitive. We have a great asset there in the apothecarium. When we bought it, they had three dispensaries. We've added two dispensaries over the last uh, over the last uh, twelve months or so. Uh, we're very excited. It, we we've been a little more impacted by COVID just because uh, we're more uh, San Francisco centric. And you know uh, what we've certainly learned over the last uh, twelve months or so is that uh, you know uh, a large percentage of our customers that came into the our apothecarium dispensaries in San Francisco were either tourists or commuters. And you know those have uh, those those are down significantly, obviously. Sure. Uh, and then right. the other dispensary we own that we were so excited about was this amazing location in Berkeley, California. And you know Berkeley has been closed for any in-person uh, classes for you know almost a year or whatever it's been. So right. that's what we're excited about. How all that's all going to come back as as everybody gets back to work over the next twelve months, hopefully. Um, yes. So, but uh, <clears throat> just in term unrelated to that, in terms of it just being a more competitive and more mature state, even though it's growing pretty nicely, it's not growing to the same extent that the East Coast is. Um, from an allocation of capital uh, perspective, we've been more geared towards, uh, towards the East Coast. You know, there's only been, uh, there's only so many dollars to invest and there's only so much brain power you have in terms of building, uh, doing big projects and things like that. And we, prior we prioritized um, <clears throat> uh, the East Coast uh, 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 over, over the West Coast uh, you know, especially from an acquisition, from an M&A perspective, we'd yeah. rather build organically in California 
we'd rather look at uh, uh, M&A in addition to organic growth, uh, you know, in the limited license states. And that, and that makes so much sense. I mean, you even mentioned, or I think, yeah, you said earlier that you were, you were already applying for a license in New Jersey in 2018, right? So you kind of saw the opportunity in the East Coast. And, you know, we've all talked about this domino effect that's going to happen. I mean, New, New York's, you know, Cuomo's talking about, uh, I think he's already put a bill pa- passed and they're kind of working it out. But you're seeing, um, what's what's the other state connecticut right i mean so there's a huge opportunity pennsylvania Pennsylvania is another i mean they're medical right now but yeah so so is that i've been talking about it as well yeah so so, yeah so that's really i mean you know a great position for terrasen to be in because you know you already kind of have that scale and that and that you know that experience on the east coast Yeah, absolutely. And I love what I love about um, company uh, uh, states like Pennsylvania that I just interjected there is I love the states where you can, uh, so to speak, uh, eat while you dream, where the medical program is a strong program where you can be profitable. And then when rec comes, it's just sort of then your business just, you know, hopefully doubles or triples uh, when that kicks in. But it's great to be able to uh, be profitable under medical, you know, certain like New York very tough to be profitable on the medical. The main reason is because New York doesn't allow sale of flour or it's, it's only allowed to be in these like encased pods. And flour is what gets people to come in the door. Right. Uh, so, um, so that is, med- uh, Pennsylvania is set up well and that's why we were attracted to it uh, originally. And because we were buying one of the largest or I think the largest market share cultivator and manufacturer at the time. Uh, and now we've gone and I think quadrupled the, their capacity over over the last year or so, and that's all come online uh, as well. And and Pennsylvania's continued to grow. I think it's over a one point one billion dollar uh, market right now. Um, Jersey was just sort of a I'd like to say it was this a ton of foresight in terms of doing in two thousand eighteen. It was partly just luck that we, that, <laughs> that was like the one state that we uh, we had an opportunity uh, to go uh, apply for the for the license. Um, but you know we did uh, you know. We applied for it. It was super competitive. I think 146 uh, applications for six licenses. Uh, and we came in like number one or number two uh, uh, score wise, because these, uh, these limited license states, they, there's, you know, uh, they score the application. Uh, and, you know, uh, we, that was our first try. So I was happy that we, uh, that we, I think we had the second highest score out of 146. Wow. Uh, I feel like we're, we're in an even better position now because of, uh, you know, all of our experience over the last couple of years. Uh, to win other applications, and we've applied organically uh, for uh, for other licenses, and we're also still looking for more uh, for more targets, uh, acquisition targets. Um, Maryland, we announced uh, uh, in the fall of last year that we are buying uh, uh, the Pure Leaf uh, cultivation uh, operation in Maryland. They had they had two from when they were buying grassroots. They needed to divest one. Right. So that will hopefully close in the next uh, in the next couple of months as well. Wow. Uh, so that'll give us the you know PA Jer- PA you know largest uh, capacity Jersey right around I believe largest capacity. Although there's some other companies that are uh, that are working on uh, cultivation as well. But I think it's going to be uh, uh, based upon rec kicking in at the end of the year. You know I think whatever whatever we see coming online uh, over the next year I think is going to be completely you know soaked up by the by the demand uh, in Jersey. And then Maryland's another good state. I think it's about a $600 million market right now. Um, and it's, uh, you know, we, we think that we can go replicate what we're, what we're doing in, in, in Jersey and Pennsylvania in, in Maryland as well. And that's another state that's talked about, uh, uh, you know, uh, full rec- legal- legalization as well. In, in any given state, if which, whatever other ones we're looking at that you might guess that we're looking at in terms of limited license states, my view is we can go in there first with just cultivation and, and, um, and manufacturing, you know, sell to the wholesale market, and that we'll get, we can pick up dispensaries over time. We won't, I won't do it the other way around, where we go for dispensaries first, and then we find cultivation and manufacturing, because it's just too hard to uh, make a really good margin or a more attractive margin if you, if you can't make uh, the product yourself. So I think that, uh, you know, it's obviously very important, uh, uh, part of our strategy that we be not just that we be able to, uh, you know, uh, make everything or a, a large percentage of the stuff that we sell on our own stores. We'll sell other stuff too, but uh, but we uh, 
I want to be the, I want to be, we need to be top three in any state where we are. So you should assume that in Jersey where uh, we're, we're looking at expanding that. Absolutely. Okay. No, that, that makes sense. And last question to, to round up the terrace end conversation, this is kind of related to policy, right? Is um, we talked a lot about on this podcast with a different guest, uh, interstate commerce, right? So if that were to happen and, you know, these states just open up, like, will, will you con- continue to kind of move on that limited license strategy when it comes to TerraSend or how, how does that all play out? Yeah, I think it's not, I think it wouldn't happen for a while. So I, and, and I'm just not sure where, when there's going to be this razor thin margin of getting any of these bills approved. I think personally, I think that there are lots of uh, senators and reps that will not vote for legalization if it includes interstate commerce because it's going to really hurt uh, a lot of their uh, in-state businesses. Right. So that's why, you know, you hear from a lot of people who say it's, it it is unconstitutional if we have legalization uh, for there not to be uh, interstate commerce or for the states to be able to block that. Uh, which, you know, which may or may not be true, but that's why I think that it would never pass if that was going to be the, the result uh, it would be to, uh, to open that up. So I think it's a while away, but that's another reason that you want to be strong on the dispensary side as well, because uh, if we do have a lot of biomass coming in from California or wherever it is where the sun shines a lot and has good growing conditions, um, you know, they're not importing stores from California. Right. So I think that that is sort of a quote unquote hedge. The other thing is, I think, <clears throat> bringing a product from out of state, say California or some of these other Western states that like are big producers, like a produce in the U.S., you know, for supermarkets and all that, because of the better growing conditions, um, I think that they will not have an uh, an advantage when it comes to uh, high quality indoor flour. So I think that those can still be in these local states. It'll cost much less to transport them, uh, and they will be they'll still have an advantage versus uh, you know, product coming in from California. I think the, I think the stuff out West will be more in terms of the manufactured products. Um, I think that the, I think that locally you can still, uh, on a state level, uh, put in uh, high quality indoor grows and that even if we, if we have interstate commerce that they'll still be able to compete pretty well. Right. Right. No, that, that, that does make sense. Um, thank you for, for sharing and your thoughts on that. So Jason, I want to talk to you now about Gage Cannabis. So I know back in December of 2020, Gage announced uh, that $20 million register A plus commitment from JW, right? And so um, we also have read within the Green Market Report that Gage is going to go public um, very soon. I don't know if it'll be this month, next month, whenever, but talk to us about gauge uh, overall as a company its mission and and its market share when it comes to the michigan market and how that market's different than the other states that you're operating in sure so gauge is it was one of the few uh, uh, eastern states uh, i'm sorry michigan yeah I, I don't know if i just said gauge or michigan but michigan is one of the few uh, uh states uh in the east that was not limited license so you could uh you know, apply for uh, and get as many as many licenses uh, sort of as you want, as long as you qualify. Um, but what it ended up doing, uh, and I think partly the timing is what made all of this play out this way. Um, the market was, you know, uh, as we discussed earlier, the market was pretty tough in terms of the capital markets were tough for all of these multi-state operators. And what they started, they needed to start prioritizing what they were going to do because they realized they couldn't, they can't just you know, go out and raise, you know, uh, unlimited amounts of money. So I believe that that's the reason that Michigan was sort of uh, abandoned by most of the uh, larger MSOs, because they said, we only want to be in limited licensed states. We only have so many dollars to spend. um, And we're not going to focus on Michigan because we think there's going to, there could be a lot of competition. And what ended up happening is there became practice. I can't think of one MSO that has a, that has a dominant position in Michigan, they left it all for what you know what I would call more the mom and pops, which just means not not public companies. Right, and that was the opportunity that was uh, open for <laughs> Gage. And you know, on top of that, these guys from Gage, like they are just they're part of the cannabis culture to more of an extent than any other company that I've met. It wasn't it wasn't a bunch of you know finance people or real estate people that decided to get into cannabis. Like they they understand the cannabis culture uh, better. 
I yeah. totally get that. Cause like, I, I do follow a lot of these companies on social media and Gage just has this like cannabis culture attitude to it where, you know, it's yeah. very authentic. You could tell from the brand. So yeah. I, I definitely concur what you're saying there. <clears throat> yeah, ab- absolutely. Good. And I'm glad that you, uh, that, that you noticed that. And so their, uh, their stores are, are beautiful and cool. Their branding is really, is really cool. Uh, they have this cookies relationship. Like to me, cookies is, you know, the top brand in the, in, in the space right now. Uh, so they have that. They were smart because they sort of affiliated themselves with cookies and, and sort of got caught up with the aura of, of cookies. And, you know, but now they've got, you know, the Gage brands are, are very strong as well and, se- and sell at a similar premium to what the cookies uh, branded products in Michigan sell at. So they were just smart in terms of the way they did that. But, you know, even in terms of like, that's the reason they got the cookies deal was because the cookies guys realized that, that these guys were the real deal, right? Right. So it all sort of fits together. Um, the, and, and as I mentioned, it was sort of left uh, open. Uh, these other large MSOs did not put a lot of money uh, into the space. And now, and now Gage has a real opportunity to be one of the, you know, I'm hoping one of the dominant players uh, uh, in, in the space in terms of being uh, the largest market share player. Uh, and they're fully vertically integrated, which I really, which I like, um, because uh, they're not planning on, they're not dependent upon the wholesale market. They are, they actually slowed down their new store openings to wait for their new cultivation to come online. So they added their brand new 40,000 square foot grow, uh, I think around October, it started being, uh, they started getting product out of there in December. They are uh, in the process of building another 88,000 square feet. Uh, of cultivation, and just based upon what they uh, what they're going to be able to make in house, they can go and open up another you know twenty or thirty stores over the next uh, over the next year or so. And when you've got what I think is one of the best retail concepts as well, I just think they're they're going to be set up to 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 be really successful uh, going forward. It's not like in a lot of these other states where you know in a lot of other limited license states, you you can get tricked possibly into thinking that their products are the best because, because they're selling the most, but sometimes it's just because they can make the most stuff. Right. Here with Gage, it's sort of because it's a little more competitive and it's not a limited license state, like the companies that come out of there are selling the most stuff. It's because people like their stuff the, the most and, you know, and, and they think that their brands are the best. Right, right. And, you know, I talked with Fabian Monaco, president of Gage recently on the podcast. And, you know, I could just get the sense from him that hyper focus of like, no, we are going to own the Michigan market. And like, you know, think about expansion from there. But like, you know, this is our bread and butter is what he was kind of, you know, getting at. And, and he just had that laser focus on that particular, um, you know, geography and space. And so um, t- tell me, and, you know, tell me how big is the Michigan market? Because from what I've read, it, it's in the top five cannabis markets in the U.S. They had a record sales number, what, this past year with 507% growth overall. Um, yep. So like, I mean, that's amazing, right? So like, it, that that's kind of surprising to me. I would never think Michigan would 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 do that. It's a big market. I think you're right. I think it's the four, number four, number five. I believe it's uh, at over a billion dollar uh, run rate. So sort of similar to uh, sort of similar to Pennsylvania, but without any major major players there uh, in Michigan. Um, and I think that uh, you know back to your comment also about them focusing on Michigan. I mean, there is no doubt that if you the, that the less states that you're in, the more you can focus on, on each and every one of them, you know, uh, truly there's a great example in Florida that, you know, uh, they, they've been, you know, a, a huge percentage of their time and focus has been on Florida and it's their backyard. And, you know, that just gives you, that gives you a better chance to win. Right. You can't, no, no matter how well run a company is, if they're in, you know, uh, 12 States or 15 or 20 States and they're competing against, uh, some other very credible company that has access to capital and, and that company is one, in one or two states, it's going to be really hard to compete against them. They just, they know what's going on. They're more in the loop. They're less, uh, you know, distracted, and, right? Yeah. They don't have yeah. so many variables going on and yeah. And then, and then it ends up forcing those companies also, the ones that will want to be more focused, it ends up forcing them to, this is back to my earlier point, to go deep and to build scale so that they also have the best margins. So, you know, truly it's a good example. I mean, their margins in Florida are like off the charts. That's because they're not, they don't have a, 
they're not in 10 states with with 50,000 square foot cultivation facilities. They're, you know, uh, have a very large percentage in one state with with massive cultivation uh, uh, facilities. And you just get so much benefit to your margin. So better chance to win and better margins. And then, like I mentioned earlier, if stuff gets more, if and when it gets more competitive and more commoditized, you're still going to have a better chance to win and have better margins because you've got scale and there's going to be prices that the other small players are not going to be able to uh, survive. So I think, you know, Gage, I, uh, that's one of the things that I've admired about them. They've had opportunities to, um, to be in other states. Uh, and they've looked, you know, over the years, they've looked at a, a couple of them seriously. And then they always came back to, we have so much opportunity in Michigan. We can't screw that up. We've got to stay focused. And that's, you know, that's a sign of maturity for, you know, Fabian's not a, it's not like he's a, you know, uh, uh, an old, uh, you know, uh, guy with a ton of experience who's been doing this forever. And I really admire that, uh, that they had the maturity, uh, the team there had the maturity to, to realize that. Absolutely. Yeah. And is there a set date for, for Gage's IPO at this point, or is that still up in the air? I th it's, uh, I think it's supposed to be, um, you know, the, the month of uh, March month of March. Nice. Yeah. So uh, that'll yeah, be exciting. Sometimes. And the ticker information for that, do you know it? I don't know it. I think I thought it was going to be gauge gauge, but I'm not sure. Okay. Yeah, it's easy that it's a four letter. Uh, <laughs> exactly. That would be what I would have guessed, but I wanted to just make sure. Um, yeah. No. Yeah. And, and, you know, I, I do want to, so I know when I posted that I'd be talking to you today, um, I did hashtag the MSO gang and I asked, you know, I always kind of open it up to questions. And um, since it's, it's re relevant and you just kind of touched on true leave, the question came in about outside of JW's uh, portfolio, what other MSO or MSOs um, are you really like, do you like? I mean, I, I like a several of them. I think I've, I've, you know, mentioned some other ones uh, in, in the past. I think all of the, all the top five or six MSOs are all pretty credible. They've now sort of stood the test of time and we've been through some tough times in the space uh, for sure. So, you know, True Leave I think is uh, solid, GTI, Cure Leaf. Uh, you know, we've uh, added uh, AYR uh, over the last, uh, you know, a few months. That one was uh, certainly less, uh, less expensive. It traded at a, you know, at a lower valuation. Uh, I think, yeah, obviously Gage, I'm super excited about. I think that one's going to do uh, amazing. We actually did, uh, just back to that, uh, you had mentioned 20 million. I think that's what we originally committed to. Uh, and we, had, we set up uh, an SPV to, for my fund investors to co-invest uh, in the deal. And we ended up getting so much uh, demand that we, we did 41 and a half million out of that 50 million. Wow. Uh, and we already owned you know, a decent percentage of Gage even prior to, prior to, that, to that deal. So I think Gage is going to be one of the uh, one of the better deals uh, there. Uh, we own some Ascend that we invested in privately. They're going to be uh, going public hopefully in the next few months. So um, I think that uh, I, I, there, there's uh, there's no monopoly on you know uh, TerraSend or Gage. There's no monopoly on sort of uh, good good operators uh, you know in this space. I think there's several of them, and this is gonna, this is a huge huge uh industry and it, you know it's obviously going to hopefully get a lot bigger uh over the next uh, five to ten years i think as long as you you know uh i joke uh i, I hate the patriots the new england patriots because i'm unfortunately i'm a new york jets fan <laughs> you know, don't, uh, don't mock me it's too much for that but it's um, been a rough couple of years huh <laughs> it's, been a, it's been a rough you know 40 40 something years <laughs> yeah. but um but uh, generally, uh, uh, but, but like Bill Belichick, he had a motto a few years ago, one of their Super Bowl years, where it was just do your job. And I truly believe that about the cannabis space. Like yeah. there's a lot of good operators and I think they're going to do well because they've just, they've been doing their job for the last uh, several years. Right. The ones that were not doing their job, they've all, the market has exposed them all at mm -hmm. this point. So I think that there's a huge opportunity and you don't necessarily, uh, you know, you don't have to be the most, uh, uh, you know, uh, genius operators in the world. You just have to be competent operators and make sure everybody's doing their job and there's not any, you know, major weaknesses. And, and I think like those, those names I mentioned, I think they're all very credible from that perspective. Absolutely. Yeah, no. And, you know, just to close this out, uh, Jason, you know, we talked about the theme of this episode being 
you know, cannabis as the next great American growth story, right? And and <clears throat> to me, and we've talked about it, right? We've talked about the Canadian LPs. We've talked about the opportunities that the American MSOs present uh, when it comes to the tax revenue for these various states and then, you know, eventually federally and what, what it could do for our economy. But then also the history of the plant and, and you know, how prohibition came about in the 1930s. And we know uh, over time that this plant was really, it affected a lot of people of color, you know, specifically black and, and brown people, right? So let's talk about the Chris Weber Impact uh, Partnership with JW and how y'all are working to, you know, undo some of those wrongs when it comes to, you know, social justice and social equity in cannabis. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, as, as, as you, uh, you noticed, we announced uh, uh, a few weeks ago that we were launching this, this $100 million uh, impact fund. That one is going to be uh, structured more like a PE fund, like a commitment fund, as opposed to my regular funds are structured more like a hedge fund where anybody could invest any, you know, uh, the beginning of any given month and be, and be a partner there. And there's also liquidity where they can take out their money quarterly. Uh, structuring it like a PE fund just gives us more, I believe it gives us more time to go out and find uh, really good um, entrepreneurs to back. Um, I think that certainly I was in the dark about the history of the plant in the US up until a few years ago. Um, I, I watched uh, the documentary, The Grass is Greener, uh, that's on Netflix. And it talked all about how um, cannabis uh, in the early 1900s was coming in through New Orleans into the jazz scene and, and uh, into uh, Texas from, from uh, Mexico. Uh, and then you had this guy, what was his name? Harry Ainslinger. Harry Anslinger, yep. Anslinger, who was a known racist and wanted to arrest as many black and brown people as he could. Um, and therefore, um, you know, uh, did a lot to, uh, to you know, do that and also uh, help create this uh, stigma and this, this false messaging about uh, how it uh, will make you crazy and it's more dangerous than other drugs and all, all of that stuff that we've learned is completely, uh, is completely false. Um, so the fact is right now, there are, you know, uh, four or five to one uh, uh, black people are arrested versus, versus white people. And there's, I think, 30 or 40,000 people in, sitting in jail for cannabis offenses. So that, that has all been a huge injustice that's uh, been perpetuated upon uh, people of color for, for a long time now. And it's still happening because there's so many people still sitting in jail and still getting arrested uh, every day. And what Chris and I were talking about when we got to know each other over the last few months is um, the fact is the operators now, the state level legal operators, um, black people make up such a small percentage of those operators. It's, it's, uh, I have said 10% in the past, I believe it's even lower than 10%. And I don't think that that is a good foundation for this industry to be built on based upon the history. Right. Um, because, uh, you know, we have to have a better representation of uh, people of color in these uh, in the industry. Um, if we if we want it to be, uh, you know, uh, a vibrant industry, that's going to that's going to be this great American growth story. So we right. were talking about what are some ways that we can do that? And what I really admire about Chris is he really um, it, it's less about making money for for him and I. It's more about uh, uh, helping. Uh, some of these uh, entrepreneurs, um, you know, um, by financing them and uh, also helping them in terms of offering them infrastructure to make sure that they're going to succeed. And he also agrees with me that uh, the only way that this is going to be sustainable and, and that we're going to be able to, you know, hopefully we, we uh, close this fund and we can even do another one in the future. Um, the only way we're going to do that is if we invest in good businesses and good people that are going to be able to build Right. Uh, long term sustainable. And, and that's the only way, you know, the industry, like I said, is going to be on a better, a better footing as well. So that's what we've been. That's what we why we agreed to do uh, to partner up on this fund. It's been the the you know, a lot of times you go out and you announce something uh, and you you're very surprised by certain feedback that you, that you get. And what I would say that I've been very surprised by this was all of the companies that I talked to or that I've been speaking to in the, in the several weeks since we made the announcement, all these companies that have uh, come forward with offers to help mm -hmm. saying, hey, you know, like say it's some little dispensary operator in Pennsylvania. Hey, we've got this great training program. 
um, we could do this for you uh, or help you set up the program for some of the companies in your portfolio. Right. There's a software company that, that we use, that Terrasend uses in Pennsylvania for our loyalty program. And the CEO sent me an email. The subject line was, uh, I can say the name of the company, I guess, uh, Blackbird. Blackbird wants to help. And he went through a whole list of all the ways that they could help. And they've had experience out in Oakland with social equity programs and all of that. And one of them was, you know, we will provide our software to any company in your impact portfolio for free for the next wow. five years. Wow. And then mentioned all of his, uh, his other friendly competitor companies out there in California that he thought would also be willing to do things like that. So that was shocking to me. I didn't think of that. Right. And that's what we've been talking about more uh, over the last few weeks is, you know, how do we set up this infrastructure? What are the things that we, that can be sort of outsourced to us that we can do so that it, uh, that for many of these entrepreneurs that haven't had, uh, you know, they haven't just not had access to cash. They haven't had access to all of the experience that so many of the, the other MSOs and other operators in the U S ha have had. And we want to be able to, uh, do whatever we can do to make sure that they are, uh, that they're successful. And Chris is going to be, uh, is going to be very, has been, uh, and will be very uh, involved. We did a, uh, uh, recently, we did one of those clubhouse uh, interviews, and he mentioned that he is retiring uh, after this season from uh, announcing, uh, you know, the NBA games, and is going to be working on this, uh, you know, full time. Wow. No, I mean, it's so encouraging to just see, I mean, you, you know, your, your asset management, I mean, you, you know, JW asset management and you have Chris Weber, and then you have other companies stepping up in the industry and making it top of mind because we're at such a pivotal point, right? It's like, we do need to make sure that this is an issue that's front and center because we don't want it to be an ugly history in the future where, you know, those people suffered even more. Right. Um, so it's great to see that y'all are, are helping, you know, these, uh, these entrepreneurs and, uh, and trying to set them up for success because there's so much opportunity as we've talked about through this entire episode uh, in the industry, you know, and it's only going to grow from here. So Jason right. Wild, it's been a pleasure uh, to have you on. I know that I got a lot out of this conversation. I know that my audience did as well. Where can people find you on social media uh, or your website if they want to learn for more information? Sure. So uh, I'm on, uh, you know, uh, Twitter. I think it's, a, uh, my, it's at Jason G. Wild. Uh, you know, some people can definitely uh, uh, reach out to me through, through uh, Twitter. Uh, our website, we, we do have a website. Uh, it's uh, jwfunds.com. They can, they can reach me there. And, you know, I can just throw you my uh, email address as well. It's, it's jwild at jwfunds.com. Awesome. Yeah, we're usually pretty responsible. Well, to you, you heard it from the man, the living legend himself, Jason uh, Wild. Thank you so much again for your time, sir. And I definitely want to have you back on um, later in the year as, you know, Gage is public and they're continuing to, uh, to do well in the Michigan market as well as Terrasend and the East Coast and in California. So awesome. Awesome. Thanks for having me. Awesome. And thank you. And thank you all for listening. Thank you. Bye.